Hi, everyone. Um, I used to write, work for Rutgers for many years uh, full time in the Rutgers Writing Program as a director. And as Kyle said, I still teach um, business and technical writing online classes for the Writing Program. And my full time job is at IUP, which is way out in Western Pennsylvania. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the notion of teaching persona and how it applies um, online. And um, I'm not going to get to everything that I have on the slides, probably. I'm trying not to read off my slides either. So you know, we'll make it through together. Um, so we're talking about this notion of um, identity and this idea that you know, identity is something kind of mysterious, ambiguous, and vague, where all the different things that make us a person come together, and that it's really retrospective. And as teachers, it's often sometimes we think about something we think about at the beginning of our teaching careers, and, and we don't really think that much about it later on, because once you kind of have a teaching persona you're comfortable with in the classroom, you don't really, you might revise it, but you might not even realize you're revising. You don't consciously think about it um, as much. So I quote one critic here, uh, well, theorist, who talks about um, when you start out teaching, you very much are thinking inwards, like, what do I look like? What do I seem like to my students? What do they see me as? And how do I appear to them? And that, you know, as you gain more experience, your focus is outward and on the students and what they're actually learning and what you're trying to be doing. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, what I use as the basis for this talk is a video that I made for one of my Writing for Business and Professions classes at Rutgers last summer. Uh, I make online videos. I'm going to talk about this more later. Um, I try to make like a weekly or a bi-weekly video for my class. And I'm going to use this video to talk about a couple issues about the teaching persona. So I'm going to jump around in the video yet. So I'm going to show you four steady minutes of it to get started because it's really important for you to understand um, my points. Then I'll show you a couple other points. We'll kind of jump back and forth to other examples to try to get at this idea of how one might have an online teaching persona versus a face-to-face -face teaching persona and how you know, they might be related. Um, so here is the video in question. Make sure that's all the way up. Obviously, I haven't gotten a haircut in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
the entire 14 minutes, unlike my students. Well, maybe they don't watch it either. We'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> That's a fake knife, by the way. So as I said, we're just hitting a few points here that will make more sense uh, in a second. Um. You can play a YouTube video to see you the whole time. Okay, so what I said was, you know, kind of looking at that with a few months distance, that was in June, I said I could kind of like close read my own teaching persona, because I don't know what my own teaching persona is, because I'm stuck being me, and I don't really know what I am like from the outside, thank God. So I said I kind of close read this after the fact. So I said, um, 
Number one, I said, I'm pretty confident in my teaching persona. I haven't shaved. I'm in the playroom. There's paintings everywhere. Um, my daughter's running amok in the apartment, and I'm not bothered by this. Um, I said, I also really like making personal, professional connections. For example, So I said, I really enjoy making personal, um, professional connections. I enjoy talking about my life and my face-to-face -face classes and my online classes. My wife, who's also an English professor at IUP, would definitely say that both of these are the result of male privilege and that she would never be able to get away with this, that she'd be looked at. We talked about this a lot while I was doing the presentation. She would be looked at as a bad mother or a bad teacher or a bad academic. But it's because of my you know, white male privilege that I am allowed to do this. Um, so I thought I'd put that in because that's her point and it's a good point. Um, I like joking around a lot in class. Um, I talk about a few theorists here I cite. You know, some people see this as a bad trend in education called like edutainment, where you know, we're more worried about um, entertaining students than we are about um, teaching them. And you know, some think of it as like they say there's like, uh, this guy Tate says there's a cast of characters including the funny lecturer. Um, so I definitely like joking around and I'm very hyperverbal and self-reflective on what I'm doing, as you can probably tell from me talking to you right here. Um, so for instance, this is a different video. So I've talked about this a little bit before. So you know, I like commenting what I'm doing and I like using really stupid examples and pointing out that they're stupid examples. Like, um, like every teacher ever, you know, I like making bad jokes and um, <laughs> using stupid examples as well. Um, so I said, um, also some of the things that, I'll jump down here, friendly list and limits. I said, I'm kind of passive aggressive in general. I'm very, very extroverted and friendly in class, which often makes students think that I'm going to give them easier grades than I give them because of my personality. So they often are actually shocked when they get a grade back from me in class. Um, so online, I also try to make this really clear, just like I do in my face-to-face -face classes. Um, so I like consciously pointing this out for students. Obviously, though, an online teaching persona is formed by other things, like some really basic choices. Are you going to run your class in an asynchronous way or a synchronous way? For me, it's almost completely asynchronous, except for a couple class chats together. And a lot of it has to do with structure, whether it's a university structure or a department structure. Um, an IUP in the English department where I teach, we have absolutely no required structure or curriculum for any of our English classes. So you could take uh, English 101 class with me and I could make you write three separate kinds of essays dealing with texts and movies and different things and you could take it with someone else and you could write a memoir about your life. Um, so obviously that's going to have a bigger effect on your teaching persona than teaching a business and technical writing class at Rutgers where it's um, very strict formatting, research writing, what you're supposed to be doing. Um, the same thing goes for attendance policies, um, course structure, and you know, the role, I put the role of student evaluations up there because this is an important one too. Um, in the writing program at Rutgers, if you get terrible evaluations every semester, someone will definitely talk to you about it. But if you get okay evaluations, it, it's okay and you're fine. At IUP, if I'm not getting like 80, 90% every semester, it's going to be an issue with me getting reappointed and the dean's gonna to talk to me and my chair is gonna to talk to me. So obviously those things affect your teaching persona um, quite a bit as well. 
So a lot of um, theorists have talked about the connection between persona and personality. Is there a connection between your actual personality and your teaching persona? And does this have to do with, uh, Elaine Showalter says that this has to do with you know, critical beliefs about your discipline. What you really believe about your subject that you're teaching is going to affect your teaching personality. Um, and then, obviously, a lot of people talk about performance. Uh, a lot of performance studies is like an emerging field now in the past few years. And people talk about, you know, you're, you're performing something that's neither real nor fictional. It's kind of a combination of both. Um, or, you know, as someone else says here, you know, you're using a mask to share your true voice. Um, I think one of the theorists here, I didn't put him on the slide, someone else said, you know, even your clothing is a rhetorical choice. The clothing you choose to wear reflects your teaching persona. Um, so I said, of these approaches, the one I liked the most was the psychoanalytic approach. And so this is, a, you know, a lot of theorists wrote about this more in the 70s and the 80s, where um, they wrote about how, you know, when you become a teacher in the first place, you're working through this ambiguous identity. And I really like this quote. I said, I'm trying not to read the slides in general, but. Um, you know, you're working through the person I used to be, the person I want to remain, the person I hate to be, the teacher I fear to be, the teacher I want to be. And that if you successfully do that, you will develop a teaching persona. And if you don't successfully do that, you have what they would call like psych, uh, splitting of your personality because you're not sure of your identity. So I said, I really like this view of teaching persona the best, um, as well as this one um, by a theorist who wrote a lot about the role of women and the role of mothers in the classroom. She was kind of a second wave feminist, she wrote about a um, famous book, Bitter Milk, where she wrote about um, the connection between public and private and the special role that women play in the classroom as being used to, being used to that transition zone between public and private, and that's what we help children do. Now, she's talking more about um, you know, younger children. She's not talking about the university setting. Um, but I really like this idea of you know, we're coming up with a language and a new language in the middle, and that's part of what your teaching persona is about. Um, another category I put here was experience. So Rutgers Writing Program has been offering online business and technical classes since fall 2007. As I said in the video, I've been teaching them since then. Um, I've been teaching at Rutgers since 2001. Um, I'm very, very familiar with what I'm talking about. Despite the fact that my daughter is laying waste to our apartment in the video, <laughs> I could probably make a lot of the points that I'm making with like a broken leg lying on the ground. Not because I'm repeating content, but just because I've made points like that so many times before. Um, and this is where core structure has a lot to do with it. I would have a lot harder time, I don't know if I would have this particular teaching persona, even though it was not willed and not conscious at the time, I probably would do something different if I were teaching Xbox online, which they offered at one that Xbox, you know, 101, the freshman writing course at Rutgers. I don't know if I would exhibit the same teaching persona, um, depending on the course structure and what the students are like. Um, so I said the quote I agreed with most uh, was Lang, and Lang wrote, um, the more experience I have as a teacher, the more willing I am to allow other parts of my life or other faces in my life, father, husband, musician, and so on, form part of my teaching persona. Um, so I have to include my wife's critique here because I love my wife and she's much smarter than I am. And she said that's because Lang is a white male like you. So just including that caveat, I am aware, just letting you know I'm aware of that. Um, so. I started using um, video in my classes. I started doing really boring screencasts using Jing, which has rebranded itself as something else now, I think. At the time, Jing was like for four minute screencast. And I won't subject you to this whole thing because it's. This brief video is intended as an overview of the final proposal. That, that's enough. You can see that's really. <laughs> That's thrilling stuff. I guarantee you my students in 2007 were really into that and watched the rest of it. Um, so I said they're evident. I said, you know, I try to sound really, really serious here. I'm not telling stories or making jokes. And in fact, I finished this video and I say, but always refer back to your book for the actual descriptions of the assignment. These videos are just meant as an extra resource to help you along, which as a student is really thrilling to hear, um, versus
So anyway, the difference saying, you know, please get in touch with me. That's what I want you to do is get in touch with me. Um, so how did I change this? Why did I change this? Uh, I think in fall 2015 at IUP, I actually started doing this. And I started using videos for global feedback on assignments, um, not for grading. And as I explained myself, I try to give you examples of me explaining this to my students rather than have me just always explain it to you. Um, so although I, be, I don't believe that the point of online classes is to replicate face-to-face -face class structure, I do believe that you know, when you can supplement something, you should. So that's what I started using the videos for, is this kind of supplement um, where I talked. One of the things that allowed me to change my use of video a lot um, was my use of both Tumblr and really expanded syllabus. So I maintain a Tumblr site for all my students, whether they're Rutgers, or IUP that has absolutely everything for our classes on it. And so the first thing I tell them is, remember this site. It's not going to go down. And then on my syllabus for business and technical writing, um, let me see if I can scroll down here, just give you an idea. For my online classes, what really changed was when I had eventually developed a really large enough library of resources that I knew the students could find the academic help that they needed in my resources so I could relax a lot more when I was making the videos for them and kind of like just you know unconsciously let what was more of my natural teaching persona improve. Um, one thing that's really interesting about this from an educational standpoint for me is that um, what I used to do every year is I would look at all my notes and my responses to student feedback and I'd incorporate that into the assignment description for the next year. So every year the assignment description would get revised. Um, however, out of sheer lack of time, I stopped doing that and just started bullet pointing things under assignments. Like these were my resources for last semester and the semester before and the semester before. And my students actually started using them a lot more. Like so if I said in the assignment description, I said link to discussion of blah, blah, blah. The YouTube counts would remain unchanged. But when I started listing them underneath in this kind of haphazard way, they started using them more. And I really think it's because it seemed like it had less to do with me telling them what to do and more of just a resource um, that was provided. Um, so when I started doing this, I used to edit any video where I made a slight mistake. Um, like even if I had a cough or something, I'd edit it or I'd completely redo um, the video. But like I said, once I felt more comfortable that I was really providing enough resources, I just started being like the way that I am in everyday life, which is making fun of myself and joking about things a lot. So for instance, you don't hear the coughing fit in this video, but I had this tremendous coughing fit because, I don't know, I've been sick since my daughter was born like three and a half years ago, pretty much. So I, I had this really bad one day where I could not stop coughing, but I didn't want to share that coughing fit here. So. So being able to do that was really valuable to me as a teacher because I know that I can be somewhat hard in the amount of work that I'm expecting and in my grading. Um, so it was really valuable to be able to joke around like that. I couldn't find this clip, but sometime this fall, my, my mother emailed me and I forgot to close my email before the video. Where are you? What's going on? And it, you know, it popped up with a preview of the email in the middle of the video. So I said, like, oops, there's an email from my mom, stay in touch with your parents, or something like that. I tried to make uh, a joke about it. Um, so I guess kind of my thesis statement, as I would tell my Comp 1 students, is um, you know, using videos in this specific way. And I still do screencasts about half the time. 
Sometimes I do just me, sometimes I screencast, sometimes I do me and screencasting at the same time. If I'm doing something really technical, like going over a worksheet I gave them back and I really want them to focus on what I'm doing, I'll screencast because I'm not you know, an important part of that. Um, but anyway, they really give me a voice that I didn't have. And I said my voice is an important part of who I am and my personality. Also, in a pedagogical way, it's a lot harder to ignore a voice telling you something than it is, you know, an email or a comment on your Google Doc or something like that. Um, so I said, you know, emotional cues are easier to follow. And I said, you know, voice and humor are key parts of my face-to-face -face teaching persona as well. Like in one of my research writing Comp 2 courses at IUP, I was talking about the difference between the literary terms of story and narrative, story being the events, what happened in sequence, and narrative being how you tell it. And I just was stumped in front of the class for a good example of it. So I took out my phone and I started reading texts that I had sent my wife complaining about my first class of the day, um, who wasn't talking, that class hadn't talked at all, and said, you know, well, this is an example of narrative. Like, I'm not saying to my wife, oh, I drove here, it took an hour and a half this morning, and then it was raining, and then this and this and this. So, I said, I really realized once I started making freer videos that I, you know, I missed this aspect of things. Um, okay, so last slide. Um, so as teachers, you know, we want to know whether what we do is effective or not. Um, so as one of the theorists I have here argues, um, you know, teachers are inhabiting roles to achieve educational outcomes. So I said, are these videos effective? I said, well, one, it's hard to know. They're just one resource among many, and I have a ton of resources. However, my students definitely write long, so they're writing a, a proposal, kind of like a grant proposal as a semester-long project. So they're definitely writing longer and more detailed um, proposals every semester. Um, but as I said, there are a lot of resources, so it's hard to know the direct comment between this. In emails and conversations with students, students have anecdotally told me that they found it um, very helpful. And I've found it's a wonderful didactic device. Like if I get an email from a student and it says, I really don't understand what I'm supposed to do on the initial sales letter, and I write back, did you watch the video? I never have a student say, yes, I watched the video, and I still don't understand. So I mean, I have kind of circumstantial evidence that they're effective. It's really hard for me to know from the course evals because no one does online course evals at Rutgers for business and technical online writing classes anyway. Maybe they do them for other classes, but they do not do my online evals. No matter what I do, I get you know, like one or two responses a semester. Um, so I can't really, you know, that's not particularly helpful for me. And I said, you know, my last point is that you know, I, I enjoy, I've actually come to enjoy making the videos as a supplement to the class. Um, so I think that, like I said, my thesis statement is that, um, you know, an online teaching persona is definitely related to your face-to-face -face teaching persona, but is definitely controlled by, you know, the specific articulation of your online class. Like, I think we did, got rid of the support for Adobe Connect at Rutgers, right? Okay. So, you know, if you're doing something like that, more synchronous, obviously it's completely different. So, I mean, my talk definitely, what I'm talking about is for a class that is mostly asynchronous and that is a highly structured class as well. Um, so, for me, the use of video has really helped kind of supplement something that I felt was lacking from my, my online classes, which was that chance to talk as myself and also, you know, pass on a lot of information in my own voice as myself. Um, I gave you a work cited here too, in case you're interested. In case you're interested in this, this is um, online. So there's a link to the presentation at the beginning. Um, so that's it. Mm -hmm.